We are on uh, week number 43, and uh, I still have trouble remembering to record. Uh, just did, uh, fortuitously. Um, happy Valentine's Day to you all. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Again, whether this is your uh, 43rd uh, lesson or it is your first, um, big ups uh, to all of uh, the folks joining us for the first time because we are holding uh, an event to benefit the One Love Foundation. Um, we could not uh, be more excited that they reached out to us and we're thrilled to have um, a charity partner um, for this event uh, as well. Um, so uh, we're gonna be uh, over the course of uh, the afternoon, uh, shamelessly parading around um, all the information you need uh, to donate to the One Love Foundation. Uh, if you haven't done so already, uh, thank you uh, to everyone uh, for uh, joining us uh, for this lesson and uh, particularly, um, you know, thank you if you uh, did add gratuity uh, to your order uh, place already, uh, which will uh, once again benefit um, the amazing work that uh, One Love is doing to educate young people about healthy and unhealthy relationships, um, empowering them to identify and avoid abuse um, and uh, learn how to love better. Uh, what, you know, uh, more, um, you know, kind of timely, uh, perfect cause, uh, you know, could you, uh, you know, come want uh, to uh, dial up for uh, Valentine's Day lesson? I can't think of one. Um, we are joined by uh, Cole Reef Schneider. Um, I hope I pronounced the last names properly, Cole. Um, say hello to the people, Cole. You got to unmute yourself. Um, Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for doing this. I'm really excited. Um, and it is, it is Reef Schneider. It's a fine German surname. Yeah, it's German. So it's, oh, I actually say Reef Schneider, but you, you can say Reif Schneider. I've heard it all. So. Oh, it's Reif, Reif Schneider. Is that more uh, authentic? <laughs> That's the German pronunciation. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I might, I might go with Reif Schneider then. Um, it just feels okay. right. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Cole. Uh, Cole, you have some wine at home, do you not? I do. Oh, excellent, excellent. Well, don't yes. be don't be shy. Don't be shy about drinking it over the course of the lesson. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll take offense if we don't see you know uh, the glass uh, as well on your feet. Oh, nicely done. Stemless. How chic. Excellent. Uh, uh, with us as always, uh, Zoe Nystrom uh, as well, uh, back in Washington D.C. Uh, joining us once again. Uh, different backdrop today, Zoe. Um, it looks like we're in the kitchen today. Very exciting uh, for those of you at home to see a uh, different backdrop uh, for, for Zoe. Um, same, uh, same dog running around her ankles, uh, I would imagine. Uh, Penny, big ups uh, if you're there. Um, I think you're just going to give folks a few more minutes uh, to join us. Thank you for uh, taking time out of this icy uh, Valentine's Day Sunday uh, to join us. Uh, no flights this week, just full bottles, um, because we're dealing with pet nat, and um, a lot of you asked about half bottles, you know, where applicable. Um, we try to, um, you know, facilitate uh, and encourage drinking uh, in responsible portions. Uh, that's really difficult with the uh, pet nats. They don't really come in half bottles, it's kind of not a thing um, that, uh, you know, the uh, hipsters of the wine world have embraced uh, as such. But uh, it should be said that these are wines that tend to be lower ABV. Um, so, you know, uh, don't feel shy about polishing off a full bottle yourself at 11% alcohol. Um, you know, maybe you'll get, you know, uh, a little further along than you'd like to for the afternoon, but, uh, you know, it won't set you back as much as, you know, the Zins uh, that we were, uh, you know, previously drinking uh, this year. Uh, at any rate, um, I encourage you, um, you know, to, uh, as always, uh, procure a couple different glasses if you're trying a couple different wines to try one against the other. Um, you know, I would say for the sake of this lesson, though, you know, we're going to get uh, a little, uh, you know, um, you know, more going to give more leeway for the sake of the tasting, you know, this is less about parsing tasting notes than it is about, you know, just kind of enjoying the spirit in which the wines were made in which they were created, uh, which is all about, you know, just enjoyment uh, on base level, um, you know, they are sprightly, they're fun, uh, they're easy drinking, and they can be more than that. Um, but, you know, first and foremost, they are, are festive creatures. And, you know, to, you know, parse them, um, you know, to, um, you know, kind of uh, microscopically um, feels like um, it is, you know, somewhat counterproductive and, and, you know, flying in the face of the spirit in which these wines uh, were made. Uh, so uh, without further ado, welcome once more, Cole Reese Snyder uh, and uh, Zoe Nystrom. Um, uh, uh, Cole and Zoe, um, you know, we're thrilled to have you uh, here. Cole, do you want to just uh, give everyone a brief word about One Love? Um, and uh, I'll post a, a link uh, for everyone if they want to get in the act early uh, and donate. Um, what is the One Love uh, Foundation, uh, Cole? Oh, 
Yeah, of course. Thanks, Bill. So the One Love Foundation was founded in 2010 after Yardley Love was killed by her boyfriend. They were both fourth years at UVA. So that's UVA lingo for seniors at UVA. Um, and now One Love was created um, to educate people on the warning signs of relationship violence and abuse. One in three women, one in four men, and one in two trans people will be in an abusive relationship in their lifetime. So while it's not talked about as much as a lot of the other health epidemics in the world, it is absolutely something that affects at least a good amount of people on this call and at least one person in your life you can probably think of. So One Loves makes it our mission to educate people and eradicate a relationship violence and abuse through prevention. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, and I'm going to uh, include a, a link here um, uh, for you all uh, to follow if you would like to uh, donate. Um, uh, you all uh, do Venmo as well, do you not, uh, Cole? Yeah, we do. So our Venmo is at One Love Foundation. I don't know if we have any Venmo users on here, but sometimes I think that might be a bit easier too. Yeah, we're just being, we're being shameless and just making it as easy as possible uh, for people to give, Cole. It's uh, an important part of the fundraising journey, the shamelessness. Um, and, you know, wine helps with that. Um, without further ado, just a little housekeeping um, for you all prior to uh, launching, uh, formally launching this lesson with a bit of verse. Um, it is the last day to get in on uh, the uh, wine event we are offering with our friends at Doden Vineyards in beautiful Anne Arundel County, Maryland, that is going off this Thursday. Uh, John Seibert, uh, our, our very own chef, has dialed up uh, an amazing three course uh, feast for the occasion. Uh, there are three bottles of wine to go with uh, from Doden. So if you're looking uh, for a come down from your Valentine's Day sugar high, uh, look no further. Um, also uh, sent around a preview of lesson 44. Uh, if you all, um, you know, want to get ahead of the game uh, and claim a flight, uh, claim some of the food uh, for next Sunday, um, you know, follow the links uh, that I sent around for the sake of yesterday's um, kind of 44 preview. Uh, without further ado, a bit of verse, and uh, this being Valentine's Day, it is, you know, tis very much the season uh, for love poems. Um, you know, it is uh, fun uh, for my sake uh, to do this because uh, it allows me to indulge my passion for poetry and, you know, uh, kind of uh, go through the backlog of poems and authors that I love uh, in the name of Wine School and uh, rediscovered E. Cummings, an author um, who uh, I think I gave short shrift um, uh, for, you know, the beautiful ways that he has celebrated love in its various incarnations. You know, there's no one form of love. You know, uh, there are many, you know, sacred, romantic, um, platonic, etc. But uh, E. Cummings um, has, you know, um, really encapsulated a lot of them in verse. I love this uh, uh, bit of poem called uh, In Time of Daffodils. In time of daffodils, who know the goal of living is to grow, forgetting why, Remember how in time of lilacs who proclaim the aim of waking is to dream. Remember so forgetting seen in time of roses who amaze are now and here with paradise forgetting if remember yes. In time of all sweet things beyond whatever mind may comprehend remember seek forgetting find. And in a mystery to be when time from time shall set us free forgetting me remember me. Uh, I love that um, uh, bit of verse you know it, it is you know very much flower season and, um, you know, uh, I love the, um, you know, idea of growth, uh, you know, that particular poem uh, encapsulates um, for the sake of our lesson because, you know, we are talking uh, growth in love vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the One Love Foundation and, you know, we're talking the evolution of wine uh, as far as uh, Petion Naturel and natural wine uh, are, are concerned. Um, you know, uh, wine uh, as we know it, um, you know, very much not a, a static uh, entity. Uh, wine is a uh, hugely uh, dynamic, uh, you know, kind of, of creature. And, you know, wine has been with us um, since, you know, well before uh, humans uh, shuffled forth, um, you know, onto uh, the planet. Um, you know, there was wine um, as soon as grapes uh, evolved and, you know, were crushed in hollows and naturally fermented, um, you know, well before us, certainly. And, you know, there is uh, quite a bit of scientific evidence to indicate that our ancestors, um, you know, be they, uh, you know, uh, chimps or, you know, orangutans uh, enjoyed uh, those fermenting grapes, uh, some more than others. Uh, fascinatingly enough, um, there is uh, this really, um, you know, fascinating uh, study of orangutans and chimps and 
Um, certain chimps uh, and orangutans, et cetera, uh, are, you know, what have evolved from our forebears, um, have, uh, you know, a, a stronger predilection uh, for, you know, those hollows with fermented grapes than others. So, you know, there are Bill Jensen and Zoe Nystrom's um, and, you know, aspiring Psalms, um, you know, uh, among the monkey world as well, which I, I think is, is, you know, somewhat poetic uh, and hugely, hugely fascinating. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, you know, in considering this thing that is natural wine, we need to consider, you know, what wine is uh, on its face. And I'm gonna start with a, a quote um, that, uh, you know, I found uh, for the sake of this lesson, uh, I was thrilled to discover that um, uh, no other uh, founding father than um, ben Franklin, who is um, purported uh, to have said that beer, uh, of all things, you know, the most profane of drinks is evidence that God loves us, um, was actually celebrating uh, beer uh, when he was referencing God's love. And it's, it's a beautiful quote because he references uh, the Feast of Cana. So uh, he was actually writing in French originally uh, to a fellow philosopher. And he said, we hear of the conversion of water into wine at the marriage in Cana as of a miracle. But this conversion is... Uh, through the goodness of God made every day before our eyes, behold the rain which descends from heaven upon our vineyards and which incorporates itself with the grapes to be changed into wine, a constant proof that God loves us and loves to see us happy. So uh, it was indeed the fruit of the vine and the miracle of fermentation that was proof that God loves us, not beer as, you know, uh, hipster brewers would have you believe. So, you know, make sure that you reference that uh, the next time uh, that, you know, a hipster brewing friend, uh, you know, uh, misattributes that quote uh, to, um, you know, the outgrowth of barley and not, um, you know, the miraculous uh, product of the fruit of the vine. Uh, at any rate, um, you know, when we consider natural wine, when we consider something like Petit Natural, I think it's important to understand that, you know, wine itself is a very natural thing. As Franklin uh, says, it will, you know, naturally come about. It naturally came about uh, before uh, we shuffle forth uh, onto uh, this planet and, you know, likely uh, will still be around after uh, we have shuffled off. Uh, what could be more natural than wine? I think the question is, you know, when we consider the natural wine movement such as it exists now is, how did wine lose its way? How did wine come to be considered uh, unnatural in the first place? How did something sacred become profaned um, so that there was need to reassert its naturalness? That is the true question of natural wine and Petit Natural, which is one of the, you know, in my mind, um, purest and most uh, kind of fun expressions of natural wine uh, in the world today. And, you know, I think in, you know, kind of unlocking that, we need to consider what wine was uh, for the uh, bulk of human history. Wine didn't change much uh, from uh, the first time that it was made, the grape vine, Vitis vinifera, um, was first domesticated in Transcaucasia, um, in what is now modern Georgia, um, uh, Armenia, uh, and Azerbaijan, although the Azerbaijanis don't drink much uh, anymore. Um, but uh, that was 7,000 years ago, uh, 8,000 years ago. Um, uh, and, you know, in the intervening thousand plus years, you know, there were, you know, uh, fits and starts. There were some, you know, certainly revolutions that came about over time. Uh, you know, uh, the grapevine uh, was taken from the forest. Uh, it was, you know, uh, you know, kind of trained in various styles, uh, pergolas first that mimicked its growth patterns in the forest. And then uh, in handsome rows uh, in the vineyard thereafter, uh, it was, you know, fermented uh, at first in, you know, stone pits clay jars, uh, barrels uh, entered the scene toward the end of the Roman era. Um, and then, you know, the monks of the Middle Ages um, themselves, uh, you know, uh, were very fastidious and scientific about identifying the best sites and about, um, you know, modernizing their vineyard practices to create, you know, uh, wines that could endure uh, for a longer um, and wines that were truly celebrated uh, vintage to vintage, and, you know, they codified some of the greatest vineyards that, you know, still exist and are celebrated to this very day. But the very process of making wine didn't change that much until the 19th century, when Louis Pasteur, um, in 1857, first unlocked the mystery of fermentation and first attributed, um, you know, to uh, yeast, the mechanism of fermentation. That was the great discovery that really transformed wine um, as we know it and unlocked it um, for the sake of you know, the scientific um, inquiry uh, into wine. Um, but, you know, uh, 
through um, really the modern era, through the last 50 years, uh, the, the method of making wine did not change all that much. And, you know, it was, um, you know, in these traditional regions where wine was made, um, you know, made in a very romantic style. And I, I love this quote um, from a, a wonderful book called Wine at War, which really, you know, kind of um, embodies the romance uh, entailed um, in that winemaking process. And this is a, a winemaker uh, reflecting on what life in the village was like before um, the world wars. And he says, uh, that life was one of legend and myth, a life which in many ways had changed little since the Middle Ages. It was a simpler time in the vineyards. Uh, we had a way of living, a way of making wine that was natural and très enchant. Um, it was made the way their grandfathers and great-grandfathers had made it. Uh, there were no experts to rely on, so everyone followed the traditions they knew and had grown up with. Plowing was done with horses, planting, picking, pruning, were done according to the phases of the moon. Older people often reminded younger ones uh, the merits of pruning were discovered when St. Martin's donkey got loose in the vineyards. Days began early and lasted until the work was done. There were no fixed hours as they pruned, checked formalities, tied back shoots that had come loose day after day, week after week, month after month. Workers came to know each vine personally. There was an almost mystical connection as they let the vines set the rhythm and pace of life. And the wine essentially made itself before people understood um, that yeast were doing the work. They understood, um, you know, um, kind of romantically uh, the notion of fermentation. Um, uh, and they knew uh, that, you know, if they left wine around, um, it would be transformed into something alcoholic. Uh, they knew that um, a poisonous, noxious gas, um, you know, would be emitted. Um, and, you know, they understood um, uh, that if they bottled too early, they could capture uh, some of this gas, uh, which essentially is, um, you know, what we are considering uh, for uh, the sake of uh, these pet nat wines. And um, I'm going to share screen here um, and show you uh, an image of, you know, just a, a basic um, you know, uh, rendering the fermentation process. It's just as simple. You have a single cellular organism in yeast, consume sugar uh, in grape juice, and it makes alcohol, um, uh, ethanol alcohol. Um, the yeast itself produces uh, energy in the form of ATP for itself, but it also produces CO2. Now, um, in a traditional environment, uh, typically uh, that CO2, it blows off um, and, you know, nothing uh, of it uh, remains in the finished wine. Uh, but uh, if you bottle the wine too early before fermentation is finished, if you pop a cap on a bottle, uh, the CO2 is dissolved in the wine and you end up with something uh, that is uh, lightly effervescent or petillon. And that is essentially what we have uh, in um, a uh, method ancestral wine here. And the first one we're going to consider um, is our uh, Vivace sparkler. Um, and, you know, Part of the joy of uh, covering these wines, especially for the sake of you that, you know, kind of are new uh, to our class, is that we're going to get to take a really fun um, four-way into different corners of uh, the old world um, and a few corners of the new. Um, and, you know, this will be very much a world tour of these, you know, isolated uh, pockets of the wine world that have embraced these ancient uh, techniques. And the first stop um, on uh, this world tour, uh, for our sake, is going to be in Italy, um, is going to be in uh, the beautiful region um, of uh, Abruzzo. And I'm going to pull up a map. And uh, this is uh, the Robosco. So uh, for those of you that purchased this wine, um, it's got, you know, a lovely kind of Roman era font. Um, it is Bianco, uh, uh, Bianco uh, Vivace. And you'll notice you don't see um, uh, Petiant Natural ascribed to this wine. And we'll talk about why that is. Uh, in just a moment, you see the vivace uh, nomenclature, and vivace is an Italian designation, kind of predates uh, petion natural, which as a term wasn't coined um, until the 90s, really. Um, and this vivace style um, was your grandfather's wine uh, throughout Italy. It was a, a bit of a seller mistake um, uh, in Italy, and it tended to be even more lightly effervescent than some of the pet nats that people have uh, become used to today. Um, so uh, we are in um, Abruzzo. Um, we're kind of uh, the, you know, uh, that sexy kind of uh, spot behind your knee uh, for the sake of Valentine's Day uh, of the boot. Uh, the boot lends itself to all sorts of, uh, you know, kind of fetishy descriptions when it comes to uh, where we are. Sadly, there are no toe wines today. Uh, but Abruzzo, miles from uh, the Adriatic coast, we have the Adriatic Sea um, on the uh, eastern side of the boot. Um, and a wine here that comes from Trebbiano, which is the ubiquitous uh, Italian grape. Uh, Zoe, what does this wine taste like to you at home? 
uh, what do you get? Uh, this is Trebbiano. It's made in the Vivace style. I'm going to talk about the means of production, but let's just talk about the taste uh, before we kind of uh, unravel that. Yeah, I think that the nose is rather muted. Um, I get a lot of like natural or like neutral fruit flavors. Um, there's a bit of like yellow plum and yellow apple, something that's a, a wee bit warmer. Um, and there's a bit of like a little rosemary toasted herb going on on the top to it, which I really enjoy. But it's very um, delicate. Yeah, does it taste like champagne to you, uh, Zoe? I mean, it has a bit of that breadiness and a bit of that nuttiness, but honestly, it's like, um, it's not gonna be as exaggerated as fresh baked croissants or anything like that. It doesn't get too yeasty or autolytic. So it's, and but like yeast and autolysis, I think goes a completely different way that's not funky yet, but is kind of somewhere out in the middle. And uh, Zoe has jumped forward uh, for the sake of our curriculum and gone from elementary school wine vocabulary to postdoctorate uh, wine vocabulary in uh, dropping the autolysis process. It's just a very complicated way of describing the way that uh, yeast cells break down after they die. And um, in sparkling wine, because uh, the bottles are sealed before the yeast have finished their job, you end up with a lot of dead yeast cells. And if you age the wine on those dead yeast cells, you end up with this bready brioche character that is um, you know, classic um, in Champagne, but a little uh, less broadly attributed to Pet Nat, uh, because these are cells of wine that tend not to spend quite as much time on those leaves. Now, um, how then is this wine made? And, you know, uh, what gives it with the texture? It almost feels like, um, you know, the Champagne gone flat, or, you know, as Garth would say in Wayne's World, you know, this Coke's gone bad. Um, you know, but, you know, for me, it's, it's a lighter effervescence, which is quite enjoyable. Um, you know, the, the Italians wouldn't say this is spumante, which would be their word for a fully effervescent wine. They would say, you know, it's a vivace style, which is um, a step shy even of the frizzante um, that they would ascribe to the uh, Prosecco that we'll discuss in just a second. You know, it is, you know, uh, just kind of playfully, um, you know, uh, just kind of suggestively uh, fizzy. Um, and that gives it this lovely freshness um, that, you know, the wine wouldn't otherwise possess. And then there's this whole cider-like quality to this wine that, you know, Zoe didn't touch on, um, that, you know, certainly uh, champagne and other sparkling wines do not possess. Um, and, you know, that is something that natural wines have in spades. And, um, you know, it can be enjoyable or not enjoyable, depending on where you're coming from. But I quite like it for the sake of this wine. Now, Trebbiano is your grape here, which is the most ubiquitous of Italian uh, varietals, uh, Trebbiano. It's everywhere. Um, it is also everywhere in France, but it goes under a different uh, no, a moniker um, in France. In France, uh, it is called Uni Blanc, um, and its most uh, famous um, role in uh, the vineyards of France is ultimately um, as the source material for uh, uh, cognac um, in particular. Um, it is less well known um, as a, uh, a varietal uh, wine um, as such, but you know, uh, nonetheless delicious. And um, uh, in spite of uh, this ubiquity, in spite of the fact that um, you know, really the Italian government paid people to uproot it. Um, you know, you have a version here that's made in a very traditional style um, that is, you know, really, I think, you know, kind of uh, fun, festive, um, and super delicious. It is made in a hugely traditional style. So this is a 10 hectare estate. Um, the, uh, the vines are uh, trained on pergolas. Um, which I, I named after earlier as being, you know, a very ancient form of vinification favored by the Romans. So this is, uh, you know, a, a form of um, vine training that would allow people to plant additional crops between the rows um, to maximize the use of their land. Because, you know, these are poor farmers. These are not, you know, um, rich doctors and lawyers in Napa, you know, uh, creating wine as a prestige project. You know, these people are, are making wine for subsistence. Um, uh, the Rosco family are currently helmed by a lovely woman named uh, Ioli. Um, uh, they make wine on their 10 hectares, um, mostly red wine from Great Pope Montepulciano, but they make this lovely sparkler as well. Um, uh, this is called the Tendone style pergola. They harvest these grapes in September, um, and then they make a, a, uh, a wine um, that they essentially fully uh, ferment, or as far as it will go, um, and uh, store um, in their cold cellars. Um, but uh, it cools down faster than the ferment can fully complete. Um, they rack this wine twice. Racking is a process of taking a wine off the lees um, uh, during the fermentation process. Um, and they bottle it before the cellar warms up in spring, which is to say that um, when the wine wakes up in spring, when the cellar warms and the wine is in the bottle, there's still sugar left. Uh, there's still live yeast in the mix uh, to complete um, in the process of fermentation. So uh, the yeast finishes this fermentation process under pressure. And as it warms up, you get a process that is lightly effervescent. That is really the core truth of the method ancestral. And it's the core truth of um, Petillon Natural. 
um, which is just a rebranding. It is a hipster rebranding of a very ancient process embodied by this particular wine. Um, you know, this particular producer, you know, they would take pains to say that their wine is not Pet Nat. It is, you know, a Bianco Vivace. It is, you know, uh, the product of an older tradition than uh, this newer uh, rebranding uh, that we have come to know and love and call uh, Pet Nat. Uh, there are other styles, um, you know, that survived from antiquity um, and, you know, have kind of different names. And, you know, we have uh, many of those for you to taste. This is Prosecco Colfondo. Um, so Prosecco is from the Veneto. It is from, you know, much further uh, north, uh, higher on the thigh of the boot, uh, the grape here, Glera. But uh, this is from uh, another uh, fabulous family. Um, and uh, I know uh, Zoe is always on the lookout for uh, a potential uh, Italian winemaking husband, a good looking dude uh, in the mix, uh, Zoe, for the sake of this uh, Prosecco. Um, and uh, he's working with Glera, which is the traditional uh, Prosecco uh, varietal. Uh, but he was working with some other traditional grape, uh, Verdiso uh, Bianchi Trevi uh, uh, Trevigiano. Um, uh, and uh, that is Bruno and his son Martino. Um, but this is a style called uh, Prosecco Colfondo. It's a little different than um, the Vivace we're tasting because um, they make a wine, then they actually add unfermented grape must to the wine at the end of the wait month. So they add basically raw juice um, to a finished wine and that kickstarts the fermentation process. So, you know, there are many roads to Rome, but this one is, is unfiltered as well. Colfoldo essentially means on the base refers to the, the fact the wine is, is on, on the lees um, uh, and ends up with a bit of sediment in the bottle, which is another thing that distinguishes these wines from, um, you know, mass marketed, um, you know, sparkling wines and champagnes, which are typically disgorged. Uh, which is to say they, they want to 86 um, that sediment uh, from the bottle. Here they're embracing uh, that leasiness, the, the texture it gives the wines, um, for the savory quality uh, that it gives to these wines. But uh, this is Prosecco as was made generations ago before it got debased as, you know, the, um, you know, wine of choice for, um, you know, the bottomless brunch sets. Um, Lambrusco, uh, we're in Emilia Romagna in Italy, uh, equally uh, has an ancient tradition of um, uh, making uh, wines in the style. Um, and uh, the, the guy that makes this isn't quite as attractive. It's a, it's a brother sister on uh, tandem, um, uh, unfortunately. But uh, wine's delicious. This is, uh, they call uh, Vigna del Padre, um, which is, you know, wine of our father um, and uh, comes from a uh, subtype of the Lambrusco grapes. Lambrusco, actually a family of grapes. Uh, Sorbar, one of them that's kind of dark pink and hued. And this one uh, bottled, um, you know, without um, any uh, filtration um, or disgorgement as well. So it's lovably murky, uh, lovely savory uh, for the sake of this one. And the last one is made kind of an old style that we were selling uh, for the sake of this lesson, Bougie Sardon. Um, Bougie um, is from uh, this mountainous corner uh, of France. Um, really fun wine. Uh, this is uh, predominantly uh, Gamay with a little bit of a grape called Poussard um, in the mix um, as well. Uh, Bougie per uh, Sardon uh, is actually, you know, deserves, um, you know, a, a more significant place uh, on the brunch table. Um, Bougie, you can't see it here, but uh, sandwiched between, uh, oh, there you go, um, Savoie uh, and the Jura on the map. I uh, hope no one yaked there, uh, but uh, you see Bougie uh, close to the mountains. Um, and, you know, universally, a lot of these regions come, uh, you know, the, a lot of these regions are, are situated in, in cooler uh, climates, uh, which uh, lends sparkling wine a brighter kind of racier quality. Uh, the Bougie, um, again, uh, is a wine that kind of predates this modern uh, pet nat uh, renaissance. So, you know, they would say, you know, we are, um, you know, a, a more, you know, uh, kind of classic, um, you know, uh, ancient uh, form uh, before uh, this thing that was, uh, has become the pet nat craze um, was, you know, rebranded and foisted upon the natural uh, wine universe. So uh, we are going to pivot and consider um, how this ancient style uh, Petillant Natural uh, became subsumed into this broader um, natural wine movement. But before we do that, we're going to uh, give the mic back to Cole and she's going to talk about um, the amazing uh, work uh, that the One Love Foundation is uh, doing um, to, uh, you know, uh, advocate uh, for healthy uh, relationships, particularly uh, on college campuses and among uh, younger people. So uh, Cole, without further ado, uh, hit it. How's, how's the wine uh, that you're drinking? What did you end up with? Um, it's red. That's pretty red. much all. <laughs> good, good. Uh, oh, it's clearly. Uh, uh, right before um, I hopped on this call, y'all, you should know, I was talking to Bill earlier today and I was like, Bill, should I watch the sommelier docs? Like before I hop on, and he was like, cool, just stay in your lane. I was like, 
<laughs> so I'm drinking a red, and that's pretty much as far Great. as we're going to get. Tasting, tasting notes are red. Awesome. Exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's about uh, your work with the uh, One Love. Cool. Yeah, totally. So thanks so much. Um, like I said before, if anyone missed it, One Love was started in 2010 after Yardley Love was killed by her boyfriend. Her death was totally preventable, and her friends and family kind of gathered around after her death and decided like, had they known the warning signs of relationship violence and abuse, they could have prevented what was going on. And then after the found um, the founding of the One Love Foundation, they realized that this is really a prevalent problem because like I said before, one in three women, one in four men, and one in two trans people will be in an abusive relationship in their lifetime. So we've really expanded our education, not only to um, college campuses, but also even younger, because every time that we've educated either someone on a college campus or people even older than that, every feedback that we've gotten is, hey, we really wish that we knew this when we were younger. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the education that One Love does. I think, Bill, um, if you want to pull up the... Absolutely. Awesome. Okay, cool. Right now, Cole. So I'm going to do what One Love does best and just give you all a little bit of education on healthy and unhealthy relationships. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting because love is such a central importance in our lives. Relationships are at every corner and we're never explicitly taught how to love. You see examples of love maybe in your home as you're growing up or in your relationships. We build friendships and navigate early romantic relationships, get married and, and bring babies home, maybe grandbabies, I saw that in the chat as well. Um, and with the expectation that we just kind of figure it out because everyone does. But as I've said, we often find that we harm and disrespect the ones we love, sometimes more than other people that we aren't in relationships with. No human is perfect. So every relationship, even if it's a healthy relationship, is going to have subtle things that are unhealthy, like maybe guilting a friend into spending time or sneaking a peek at your partner's texts. A hundred percent of us will be on the receiving end of unhealthy behaviors. And also a hundred percent of us will do unhealthy things. It's just part of being a human. So on the screen here, you'll see what One Love has classified as the 10 signs of an unhealthy relationship. I'm going to quickly kind of run through those and how I see them. Not, I'm not going to go through all of them, but just the ones that I see to be most prevalent. So intensity, you'll see that up on the top left. I am sure that everyone on the call knows what intensity is, but as you can understand, abusive relationships don't start out as abusive. If someone were to be mean to you on your first date, the first time you meet them, they hit you, you, you would never speak to them again. But normally they start out as exciting, exhilarating, um, and the intensity, there's an intensity of affection and emotion because it's new. It's almost like a rush and it feels really good. So, but unhealthy love, with unhealthy love, these feelings can kind of shift over time from exciting to overwhelming and maybe a little bit suffocating. So that would be a really good example of intensity when it goes from a shift of exciting, um, intense beginning of a relationship to overwhelming and suffocating. The next one I wanna point out is isolation. Isolation is one of the most frequently missed and misunderstood signs of an unhealthy relationship or unhealthy love. And a lot of people are like, how could you miss that? But also because every new relationship, like I said, starts out pretty intense and there's a really deep desire to spend a lot of time with your new significant other. So isolation creeps in with your new partner, boyfriend, girlfriend. They start pulling you away from your friends, family support system, and then tethering you more tightly to them because you don't have that support system. The next um, one I want to talk about is extreme jealousy. So this kind of goes with intensity as well, but as the honeymoon phase of your relationship begins to fade, extreme jealousy can creep in because you might not be spending endless amounts of time with your partner. They might start following you everywhere, or online, offline, um, especially in today's world, it's pretty easy to stalk people, whether it's in a cyber way or just because our locations are so readily available, whether it's an Instagram location or you're sharing your location on Find My Friend, something like that. Um, two more I want to talk about are belittling. So this will often happen kind of in subtle ways. 
Um, for example, when you're trying to explain that your feelings have been hurt to your partner and they shut you down or accuse you of overreacting, saying things like, why are you so sensitive? What's your problem? Give me a break, anything like that. And then the last one that I do wanna point out is volatility. Everyone has that token couple in their life that has frequent, frequent breakups and frequent makeups. This can be a warning sign of an unhealthy relationship because on average, unhealthy relationships, if you're trying to get out of an unhealthy relationship, on average, you break up about seven times before it ends for good. So I thought I always find that fact to be a little bit jarring. Um, I know I've talked a lot about unhealthy relationships, but before I kind of wrap up, I do want to talk about um, an example of a beautiful relationship I've had as an example in my life. My parents are a gorgeous example of healthy love. They fight fair is probably one of my favorite things about my parents is they communicate. They don't fight. They talk through everything. And so um, this Valentine's Day, I encourage y'all to talk, communicate with your partner um, because like I said, all of us are going to do unhealthy things, experience unhealthy things in our lives, but it's how you navigate it. It's how you navigate it together. One Love has so many resources that are available to you online and they put it in digestible little pockets of information. So it doesn't just seem like you are sitting in your sex ed class in middle school and there's like an old woman talking to you about how you should be in relationships. One Love makes it really approachable so that you're able to have conversations. I know I'm talking at y'all today, but conversations like the one we would be having today if we were in a room together. So um, we dropped our education center in the chat and um, that's pretty much it for now. Um, just a, a couple quick questions for you, Cole. Um, yeah, go ahead. Do you have resources for people that, um, you know, are, you know, know that, you know, know and love, you know, uh, friends or family members who are in abusive relationships in terms of how they can, you know, support those people, um, you know, in finding ways to, to love better or extricate themselves from? Those yeah. Things? So that's actually a really good question. And the answer is yes. Um, because uh, even when I'm talking about it now, it's really easy for people people to say like, oh yes, I have a friend or I can imagine myself being in a situation of a friend trying to help a friend get out of an abusive relationship. No one ever likes to think about themselves being in that position, but the answer is yes. Um, One Love has a plethora of resources and workshops on their website to help navigate exactly that. And then I was pretty amazed at the, the scope of your work. So, you know, you're not a, a local organization. You all are, are national and have grown, you yeah. know, pretty, um, you know, remarkably since since yeah. uh, you know, the, the organization was founded because I, I can remember you know uh, uh, yearly was um, her, her killing was was a, a very big local news story yes um, and uh, you know I, I wasn't aware of your work and it was really exciting and thrilling to hear that you know something so positive came out of that tragedy absolutely because I mean even Sharon Love Yardley's mom said like no parent should ever have to feel like this um, and now One Love has educated over a million people within the United States because the best type of prevention is going to be preemptive and education so that no one ever has to be in that position again. Great. Uh, Zoe, do you have any questions, uh, be it for me about, um, you know, uh, the ancient origins of a pet net, you know, uh, 8,000 years of wine history in, you know, uh, 15 minutes, uh, or Cole about uh, the amazing work that One Love is doing? Yeah, um, I think, I mean, as a woman, you know, we all look out for each other and we are, um, I think there's like, without gender being included, there's always um, in friend groups, uh, a certain amount of watchfulness, which I always enjoy. Um, and your website has such great strategies to be able to look for those and how to implement them. I would say like, what is the question of like, when it gets to like the scary point, when it needs to have police involved, how do you navigate that interpersonal relationship without feeling like you're getting like your friend in trouble or causing more drama into their life, I would say. So do you mean like when it comes to a place when you as a friend are trying to help another friend and it's like in a scary place? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, One Love does a really good job of education and I don't wanna make the mistake that I'm a certified counselor because I'm not. Um, but One Love does do a really good job of talking about how to make a safe breakup plan. Um, and we learn facts like in the six to eight weeks following a breakup of an abusive relationship, you're 72 times more likely to be killed by your partner. 
So after the breakup is going to be the most dangerous period. And um, that's a really startling and scary fact, but that's why One Love emphasizes so much the importance of a safety plan for breakups, because a lot of times people are just like, why don't you just leave an abusive relationship? But kind of like you hinted at, it's really not that easy. And that's why it's really important that you have a plan in place because it's not going to be black and white. There is a gray area and every situation is really different. Thank you. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Cole. Um, uh, you're going to come back and you're going to have a toast for us at, uh, at the end of the lesson. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> uh, hopefully you'll be able to give us, uh, you know, uh, a tasting note other than red for the wine that you're drinking uh, at that at that point uh, as well. Not not to okay. not to put too much pressure on you, but uh, we're Thanks gonna so. we, con we considered you know um, you know basically effervescence in wine is an old thing, and you know uh, CO2 is a natural byproduct of fermentation, so it only goes uh, you know uh, it's, it's very fitting that you know occasionally. Uh, this natural byproduct ends up dissolved in the wine itself. And, you know, in the case of uh, the first wine that we tried, Bianca Biace, you know, that happened, you know, kind of at first by accident, then in a way that the, you know, Italians um, in Abruzzo, in Emilia Romagna, in the Prosecco zone, you know, the French in places like Bouchy Cerdon, in places like, um, you know, uh, Gaillac, um, in other corners of the world, you know, learn to harness uh, for the sake of these lightly effervescent wines. And this is before champagne. And it should be said that, you know, the, the most significant difference between champagne um, and, uh, and pet nat, um, as we come to understand it, is the, A, the amount of bubbles. Um, so champagne has a, a more effervescence. It's bottled under higher pressure, but also the way those bottles come about. So um, uh, Petillon Naturel is made in a process called the method ancestral. And there are a lot of tweaks that you can make to that method. But the core truth of it is that um, it's just a, you can just think of it as a wine that's bottled early. And because it's bottled early, while there's still sugar um, and active yeast in the bottle, uh, it, finishes uh, it finishes fermentation under pressure. And uh, if voila, uh, you know, uh, there are bubbles in the glass. Uh, Dom P sees stars, um, you know, we're all, um, you know, uh, living life in a grander fashion uh, on our on our front porches. But um, you know, as Petillon uh, Natural is concerned, um, you know, uh, insofar as the natural wine um, like making movement uh, goes, um, you know, a very fascinating origin story there. And and uh, we kind of have to go back to the industrialization of wine in the first place. So uh, we named dropped Louis Pasteur. Um, uh, 1857, he, you know, unlocks the scientific mystery, um, you know, yeast, uh, they gobble up the sugar, um, you know, uh, byproduct, alcohol, um, and, and CO2 of their energy production gives us wine. You know, he unlocks that mystery uh, for, for mankind. Um, concurrently, you have all of these blights um, that have everything to do with, you know, uh, the fact that the world is getting smaller. So things like powdery mildew uh, make their way to the old world. Things like phylloxera make their way to the old world. Um, and not only does, uh, you know, Louis Pasteur's, um, you know, uh, scientific inquiry become, you know, more fascinating, you know, just on an intellectual level, but, you know, that type of scientific inquiry becomes more necessary to solve, uh, you know, these problems that have, uh, you know, come about uh, in the vineyards of the old world because, um, you know, the world is getting smaller. And, um, you know, so you have all of these uh, solutions to these very modern problems. Um, and, uh, you know, among them, um, you know, uh, some soils that, you know, have become exhausted. We see um, a chemical fertilizer um, really invented by Fritz Haber. He received a Nobel Prize for that in 1909. Um, before that, you know, all fertilizer was organic. And then um, you see, uh, filtration um, at a molecular level, um, at a subatomic level, an outgrowth of the nuclear age. Um, uh, so um, all of these ways of making wine that we take for granted now really didn't come about and weren't popularized until after World War II, because, you know, World War I to World War II period in the old world is pretty much a wash. Um, uh, and, you know, these great vineyards, this very romantic life that I described uh, earlier, you know, this life that is, you know, guided by the rhythms of nature um, is uh, abruptly torn asunder. Um, uh, and, you know, once it comes time to rebuild after World War II, uh, the vignerons of Europe have all these tools at their disposal um, to unlock the capacity of their land. They have chemical fertilizer, they have uh, filtration at a, a, you know, microscopic level that allows them to make more wine cleaner than they ever have before. They have all these chemical uh, interventions uh, that they can use to spray 
um, to kill various blights, some of which came from, you know, the New World in the first place, some of which have always existed. But, um, you know, the French, you know, the Germans, you know, uh, everywhere they make wine in the old world, um, you know, people enthusiastically embrace these modern interventions. They never look back and something is lost uh, in the process, something of that ancient rhythm, something of that, you know, mystical appreciation of, you know, uh, life on the land and these styles of wine, you know, such as we enjoyed for the sake of this wine, which was made without any, you know, chemical invention, something is lost. And I love this quote. Um, uh, this is from uh, Inherit the Wind, and they're talking about uh, you know, scientific progress. They say, uh, progress has never been a bargain. You have to pay for it. Sometimes I think there's a man who sits behind a counter and says, Madam, you can have a telephone, but you'll lose privacy and the charm of distance. Mister, you may conquer the air, but the birds will lose their wonder and the clouds will smell of gasoline. And comparably, you know, in wine, we acquired all these means of making more wine than was ever made before and making wine that didn't suck. Um, you know, a lot of, I don't want to glorify this, you know, pre-industrial wine that was abounding. You know, a lot of it was plunk, a lot of it was vinegar, a lot of it was med, you know. But, you know, that said, a lot of it was, um, you know, vital and alive in a way that was lost when, um, you know, the vineyards of Europe, you know, kind of consciously moved in a more modern direction. And, um, you know, come, uh, you know, 1960, 1970 or so, uh, there are, you know, these assorted voices in the old world that are beginning to bemoan uh, this loss. And uh, chief among them, a gentleman named Jules Chavez. Jules Chavez uh, came from a winemaking family. He trained as a chemist. Um, and he unlocked a lot of uh, the mysteries of fermentation, one of the first people to scientifically document the process of malolactic fermentation, carbonic, ferm carbonic maceration. Uh, he was a very astute taster and advocated for lowering sulfur levels in wine, sulfur being a hugely important uh, preservative. Um, that was another um, ancient innovation that was you know, enthusiastically embraced by more modern viticulturalists. Um, and he is one of the first people that says, you know, let us stop, you know, aggressively uh, spreading uh, these uh, chemical treatments that are uh, denuding the land and have stripped the soils and nutrients by the 60s and 70s. And uh, Jules Chavez uh, wants us to make, um, you know, a, a, a strong 180 degree turn. He wants us to look back to these pre-industrial methods that sustained the vineyards um, and, uh, you know, created wines um, using natural yeast um, as opposed to um, the yeast uh, created to um, ferment um, wine more efficiently in a lab, but, you know, making wines that, you know, tended to have, you know, a, a more, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, one note, uh, you know, a, a less, you know, kind of profound, uh, multifaceted uh, kind of quality. Um, you know, Jules Chavez uh, wants us to, to recapture uh, that former glory, and he finds protégés particularly in Beaujolais, uh, particularly in uh, Marcel Lapierre, particularly in the Gang of Four. And uh, some of you are tasting uh, a wine from one of their disciples, um, the brothers Theardan. Uh, this is a Gang of Four. You can see uh, Marcel Lapierre. He's the gentleman with glasses and a white beard. Um, uh, that's a goofy blogger in the background. Uh, but from left to right here, you have um, some of the foremost natural winemakers um, uh, who were really among the first generation uh, in France to start looking back and to aggressively promote um, and popularize the notion of making wine uh, without chemical interventions in the vineyard and without uh, a, a strong hand in the cellar, allowing the wine to ferment itself as it once did um, and intervening with sulfur as a preservative as little as possible. And uh, these giants of the natural wine world are from left to right, uh, Jean Foyard um, uh, in profile, um, uh, Jean-Paul Thévenet, um, Paul Paul to his friends, uh, Guy Breton, uh, uh, Petit Max uh, in the fabulous pink sweater, Marcel Lapier, who's kind of the leader of the gang. Uh, I'm not quite sure who that is on the right. Um, uh, the good looking younger book uh, is Steve Ney's son, uh, Charlie. Uh, he actually makes really lovely wine um, uh, himself. And then that's a goofy blogger in the background. But, you know, that's, you know, um, that they are kind of like the Beatles of, uh, you know, the natural wine world. Um, you know, they're the ones who uh, initially in Beaujolais, at least, you know, uh, started spreading this gospel. Um, and this gospel was, was picked up um, by um, other vignerons uh, throughout uh, France, um, among them a uh, coterie of winemakers in the Loire uh, Valley. Uh, Loire Valley, very different, you know, in and of its own way than, than Beaujolais, cooler climate. Uh, there's a much stronger tradition of making uh, sparkling wine um, in the Loire Valley. Um, uh, and as such, you see uh, these 
uh, winemakers um, in the Loire Valley um, who are, are making wine in kind of a non-interventionist style. Um, and uh, they are, um, you know, embracing, uh, you know, kind of uh, working in this modality um, that is essentially pre-modern, um, you know, that is, you know, trying to benefit from the wisdom of, um, you know, uh, grandfathers and, and other forefathers. And, um, you know, among these, um, uh, you know, kind of natural winemakers in the Loire, um, uh, a few uh, stand out um, and uh, a few were kind of the, the progenitors of uh, this Petnat movement because Petnat, uh, as we know it, you know, uh, hadn't kind of recaptured um, the modern imagination yet, but it was Christian Chossard and Thierry Pugelet um, who really kind of took up the banner. And um, Christian Chossard was working uh, in Vouvray, uh, Vouvray along the Loire River. Um, Chenin Blanc is the source material. Um, and uh, he was working without sulfur. And, and sulfur uh, inhibits uh, the activity of the microbes that will ferment wine. Um, and it also acts as a preservative and antioxidant. But he was making wine without sulfur at all. And he noticed that in Vouvray, where very often the cellars get colder in the winter, uh, and wine ha by happenstance is bottled, uh, the way you know our Italian friends did here with a little bit of sugar, he noticed that if he was you know uh, uh, bottling this wine a little too early, you know uh, by accident he would end up with something that was sparkling, um, you know in in the spring. Um, and uh, he took this wine and he took what was ancient um, and he rebranded it uh, as hipsters are wont to do. So Jerry Pulisic Pizzoli tells the story um, that uh, he coined the phrase Petnat uh, near the end of the 1990s. Uh, for this accidental rediscovery. And we all adopted this term, which is both concise and clear, and now it has passed into the everyday language of the viticultural world. And uh, the, the importer Louis Dresner says that, you know, uh, it's more like uh, Chassard. Uh, he reclaimed a style that, you know, previously existed, um, just like Marcel Lapierre rediscovered a style that, pre, uh, you know, that had already existed um, in, in Beaujolais. Um, they were reclaiming the style of their fathers and grandfathers and, you know, uh, reclaiming it uh, as something else. And they've been hugely successful at it. And so uh, next up, we're going to taste, um, you know, a, uh, a pet nap from Mont Louis. And I'm going to pull up a map here again, a uh, branch to, to situate Mont Louis for you. Uh, Zoe, you're enjoying this wine at home. Um, uh, what does this one taste like compared to the first uh, offering uh, that we had tried? I think that this one is much more champagne-like, if we want to say that. I get a little bit more of that um, little brioche, a little butteriness coming in, but it is still very light and very pleasant, very elegant. I love all of the flowers on it and has a bit of that juicy spoon fruit, um, nectarines and peaches and just like all my favorite summer things that I want, just like a fresh peach and like whipped cream. You know, it's, it's quite gorgeous and I really enjoy the texture of the wine as well because the bubbles are a little bit more subdued, I think that that's why I'm able to get more of those um, specific flavors that are going on. And you'll notice this wine has been disgorged. So um, we're gonna talk about that in a second. You know, what is this whole disgorgement uh, situation I talked about? Essentially that minor sediment has been removed. So, you know, whereas for the sake of the Robosco, um, that uh, Robosco being a producer, but the Vivace Italian uh, style one that I tried earlier, uh, this wine is murky and we're gonna, you know, uh, introduce some wines that are murkier still uh, for the sake of this lesson, but this wine is crystal clean. And what I love about it is that it's a wine that's made in this, you know, uh, kind of very ancient style. This is made in the, the method ancestral, which again is that, you know, continuous fermentation cycle bottled early, but it's hugely sophisticated. Um, and I think it points to this diversity um, uh, that, you know, uh, this um, method is capable of, uh, you know, subsuming under one roof. So, you know, there's not one cider like pet nat. A lot of them taste that way, but there are um, pet nats for people that don't kind of consider themselves traditional uh, natty wine drinkers. You know, this is a very much a natural wine. Um, it's made in an ancient style. It's made with a minimum of intervention in the cellar um, and, uh, and in the vineyard, uh, but it tastes clean, it tastes sophisticated, it tastes as polished as any champagne uh, that I can conjure. So the grape here is Chenin Blanc, um, uh, it should be said uh, that the, the winemaker here, um, uh, uh, a younger gentleman, uh, ambitious, a uh, younger vigneron, he's actually um, the um, uh, head of uh, the, the Mont Louis uh, Growers Association, Mont Louis being, again, the center of uh, the Loire Valley. I did a terrible job of breaking down that map, but uh, had you been paying attention, it was close to Tours on the south bank of the Loire, across from Vouvray. So always languished um, in the shadow of Vouvray, um, historically. Um, and uh, for the sake of, you know, this particular 
uh, Vigneron. Uh, he is now the president of uh, the AOC. So uh, he is setting um, you know, the standard, the legal standard um, for these wines uh, in his small corner of the French speaking world, um, along with his wife. Um, and there's actually a designation of origin uh, for wines made in the Petnat style in Mont-Louis, which was the first of its kind in France. So uh, typically in France, you know, these rebel winemakers, the Pujolais, the Chassards of the world, um, you know, they were making wine um, outside of the formal, uh, formally established French system. And very, you know, the, the um, natural wine movement in France very much a reaction against uh, the French bureaucracy, which came to favor more uh, kind of industrial uh, producers. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these, um, you know, kind of iconoclastic, um, you know, Lapier gang uh, disciples, you know, uh, pushed, um, you know, their way out of that system and made wine under kind of a, a, a uh, you know, more kind of like uh, plebeian, uh, Von de France, um, uh, you know, label. But um, uh, what I think is, is really cool um, about the work of, you know, these younger winemakers is, you know, they're moving back, um, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, trying to, um, make Petnat a part of, you know, enshrine it in law, you know, make it a part of, you know, the legal tradition of French wine. And um, uh, Damien and um, in his, in his cohorts in Mont Louis, um, uh, Damien Delechaud, uh, the gentleman uh, to the right here, um, have enshrined it in law as of 2007. Uh, you can make Petion Original, uh, which originates in uh, Mont Louis, which is the only designation of origin for Petnat uh, in France, which I think is is super cool. Um, and, you know, I just love how sophisticated, uh, seemingly sophisticated, um, uh, this wine. Uh, is um, and taste. And I think, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, flies in the face of, you know, this traditional um, notion of pet nat as something that is, you know, cider-like um, and more of a one-off. Um, and, you know, what, pet nat can be, um, you know, equally profound wine. And I would, uh, you know, love to see the way that uh, this particular one ages uh, too. Um, uh, Zoe, do you have any questions uh, from the commentaries uh, about the wines that we're drinking today? Absolutely. We have um, some great questions as well. And to start off, is it safe to assume that there is no um, dosage or um, a liqueur de tirage like there is in champagne production? Uh, that's a that's a ex, an ex, <laughs> almost a great question, but I don't know that to rebrand at that point. But um, yeah, killer question. Um, so um, that whole process of introducing, you know, uh, uh, various liqueurs um, uh, has everything to do with the fact in in um, champagne that, uh, you know, you're dealing with a finished wine. So champagne is a two-stage process. Um, there are two fermentations. Uh, the first fermentation um, makes a, uh, what's called, what they, what they in champagne call Bon Clair. Um, and uh, Bon Clair though is, is fully fermented dry wine. Um, uh, whereas uh, in making Pet Nat, um, the wine does not fully ferment first. The wine is essentially unfinished. Um, and as a result, Pet Nat has all the ingredients to still ferment. It has uh, sugar um, that's still fermentable um, and it has yeast that are still active. So there's no need um, for, um, you know, the, the liqueur d'exposition, um, which is the catalyst for the secondary fermentation in Champagne. So they don't need that catalyst uh, for the sake of uh, making Pet Nat because the catalyst is already there. Um, that's the beauty of bottling early because there's still yeast uh, there's still active, uh, there's still sugar um, that's, that's unconsumed. Um, so there's no need to add, um, you know, great must, uh, sugar water, uh, what have you. Um, it's one continuous fermentation process um, bottled early as opposed to the two stage process that's carried out in champagne. Fantastic. What Ooh, else um, are there any Cadbury aged? Petnats? There fucking are. Um, there are. We have them. Um, uh, they're, it's definitely a niche product. Um, uh, I love them. There's one, uh, there's these uh, blokes I drank with in uh, uh, in Georgia. So the uninitiated Cabeveri is a traditional Georgian amphora. I named drop Georgia as the birthplace of wine as we know it, you know, seven, eight thousand years uh, worth of vintages. Um, a couple Frenchmen actually um, uh, from uh, bougie Sertone country, um, uh, they make Petnat um, in Kakheti, um, originally fermented, uh, initially fermented for the first part of the fermentation process in Kaveveri and then bottled early. Um, and it's stupidly delicious. Um, we carried, have carried them off and on uh, at Tail Goat. They're, you know, very much a niche product. They don't make a ton of them. Uh, it's hard to make wine at scale in Kaveveri. Uh, I hope to bring them in again. Uh, they're, they're really cool. Um, but yeah, that does, that does exist. So glad to hear it. 
Um, how do you suggest serving unfiltered pet mat in particular? Because it's not a decanting situation and you're going to have all of those um, extra bits at the bottom that may not be yeah, pleasant. The bits are fun. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, I'm gonna, this is a wine from Nancy Ireland. Um, we're going to take a, a full tour of, uh, I want to, you, know, uh, you know, really address the wines that you guys, um, you know, purchase through the store. And, um, you know, I, I, I feel like, you know, given that we sold the baker's dozen, you know, I want to, you know, give them all a proper shout out, but, you know, we're focusing on a few just for the sake of time. Um, you know, it should be said that one of the things I love about the wine world, you know, so I pulled up that picture uh, earlier of uh, uh, Damien uh, de la Chanot and, and, you know, uh, I, and I spoke to this, this ancient culture of winemaking and, and, and you name drop the Gang of Four. Well, in, in that generation, the Gang of Four generation, so, you know, they're in their 60s now, 60s, 70s. Uh, sadly, Marcel Lapierre, the, the gang leader, passed away in, in, in 2010. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, people didn't travel that much, you know, so in, in that generation. So, you know, they, they were channeling the wisdom of their forefathers um, and, and their outlook was, was more provincial than global. Um, uh, subsequent generations, so uh, the Lapierre um, estate now run, um, uh, you know, uh, very ably um, uh, by uh, his children. Um, uh, uh, Camille, um, uh, his daughter, and Matthew, his son, uh, awesome, awesome people. Um, and, uh, you know, it should be said that they're, the, the outlook is more global, you know, so, so someone has an idea that is resurrecting, um, you know, this ancient style of wine, pet net, and it spreads globally, uh, because, you know, in Damien's case, he, he studied winemaker, winemaking in Montpellier, which is like the, one of the Harvards of French viticulture uh, in Bordeaux, uh, but he, he worked in California. He worked in South Africa. Everybody, when they're, you know, working their way up uh, in the wine world, they, you know, they globe hop because, you know, the most significant time in the wine calendar is harvest. And, you know, you can spend uh, harvest in the Southern Hemisphere and kind of like double your pleasure for the sake of learning, you know, kind of reading the most you can out of your wine calendar. And um, it's super cool that, you know, there is this lingua franca of wine. And especially for people that are interested in working in the style, natty wine, there's very much, you know, this codification of, of wisdom. And, um, uh, so you, you get this like world tour of pet nats from these people that, you know, have traveled, have researched these wines online that, you know, kind of speak the same language. And um, Nancy Ireland is one of those. She's in the Finger Lakes of New York. Um, she's a badass. Uh, she looks like a, you know, aging hipster. She kind of is an aging hipster. Um, uh, I was actually trading uh, notes with Nancy. And uh, so she is rigorously scientific. Um, so she uh, comes out of the UC Davis system, which is fascinating because UC Davis, you know, very much uh, in uh, the United States um, promulgated this notion of, um, you know, industrial wine. Uh, post World War II, UC Davis was, you know, spreading this gospel of chemical fertilizers, inoculated yeast, sulfur, sulfur, sulfur. Um, and, and Nancy was very much kind of a part of that in her training, but she loves pet nat. And she, um, you know, is increasingly embracing, you know, these more kind of, uh, you know, frivolous, you know, idiosyncratic styles of wine. I asked her what, um, she, she loves about it. Um, and she says, uh, she said, you know, just trading text said, uh, the unpretentiousness, it's just frivolous efforts. It should never be taken seriously. And she said, never in, in all caps. And, um, you know, we need more wine, uh, like that. And, um, you know, uh, and I think, you know, just to, you know, bring things full circle, you know, I think, uh, in, you know, loving one another well, um, you know, a lot of that is about humility. Um, you know, loving anything well is about humility and just, you know, basking in the fun of it all. Um, and, you know, I love the way that Pet Nat brings that to the wine party. And, you know, Natty Wine, Natural Wine Movement has its faults. You know, it gets sanctimonious. It gets lost up its own asshole. You know, that happens. Um, you know, anytime you have a revolution, you know, you're going to get Jacobins. Um, but, you know, what's fun about it is necessary corrective to, you know, the, you know, pretentious, you know, um, you know, cellar dwellers of the world. Um, and, you know, these are wines that in demand um, and, you know, should be enjoyed, you know, prima fascia is fun, um, which gets to uh, the question you originally asked circuitously, which was Lee's, which is uh, this whole filtration thing. So um, I know you can't see this, this is a terrible, um, a terrible illustration, but um, here we go. We're gonna, we're gonna swirl this one up. I won't open it, but look, this is murky. Look at, look at that, you know, uh, this is the Portuguese from uh, Maria Pato, daughter of another famous winemaker, Luis Pato, sister of Felipe Pato, um, uh, who some of you remember from previous lessons, but um, uh, you're gonna be left in any sparkling wine with sediment because it's unfinished business in the wine world. Anytime you carry out a fermentation process, you get dead yeast and particulate in the bottle. 
And the way they 86 that in Champaign is through a process called um, disgorgement. So uh, uh, they take the wine that is murky. You saw how murky uh, my wine was. And uh, they uh, situate it on its side in what's called riddling racks. Um, so uh, this is uh, a gentleman, he is called a rumeur. Um, rumage is a process. The rumeur goes from bottle to bottle. He twists it uh, lovingly, uh, quarter turn every day. And through that action, uh, the sediment that you just saw in the bottle comes into the neck. Um, and uh, at that point, uh, once it is uh, settled um, into the neck of the bottle, and I did get, I got a picture of that as well, because it's wonderfully evocative. Uh, it should be said too that, you know, the crown cap um, that is kind of like the hipster signifier for Petnat, most, if not all champagne ages with a crown cap. It doesn't age with cork. Cork's fucking expensive and a pain in the ass, and they can, um, you know, kind of uh, diminish and denude a wine uh, through cork taint. Uh, typically, a champagne ages with a crown cap, a beer bottle cap. Uh, but um, over time, if the remur has done his job right, uh, you know, correctly, uh, this uh, lazy bit settles into the bottom of the bottle, um, at which point you plunge it into a uh, ice cold salt water solution because salt water is at a lower temp, um, uh, uh, frozen, or, or is, it can freeze at a lower temp than, than regular uh, water. Uh, you, you plunge the neck of the bottle uh, into that freezing uh, sluice and uh, you get a frozen plug that you then evacuate when you 86 is cap. Um, and then uh, at that point you add uh, the cork and you get crystal clear wine. Now you can do that with Petnat as well. Uh, and it should be said the Nouveau Ney that we tried was disgorged. And a lot of the more serious Petnat producers in France are moving more toward disgorgement. But you know, I think it's a wine that can be appreciated both ways. And I think, you know, the fun of it is that you can also make farmer fizz that is lovably natty and undisgorged. So for somebody that, um, you know, is hugely scientific, you know, like Nancy, I feel like her pet nat, in this case from Pinot, which we're not selling, this was a gift from Nancy that, you know, uh, felt fun to unlock for her today. You know, uh, you can, you know, take something that you take, you know, hugely seriously in your day job. You're making shard, you know, you're making, you know, some of the greatest Riesling in the world. You know, people demand, you know, a certain level of consistency out of that. They demand, you know, something without chunky bits. Uh, but you can also on the side make something that's natty and irreverent and inconsistent and have fun with wine, God forbid, under the pet nat umbrella. And that is what, you know, at the end of the day, natural wine and petit en naturel should be all about. Uh, Cole, uh, we're gonna kick it over to you for your toast and then we're gonna uh, make our world tour and answer all the questions. Um, uh, first though, um, Cole, uh, did you come up with a tasting note for your wine that is not red? Yeah, it's, um, I Googled wine words. Oh, nice. Um, well done. Yeah. Uh, full bodied. Full bodied, um, full bodied red. Can I, can, yes. can I see your bottle? Can I, uh, do you have your bottle on hand? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's pouring for you from a, a virtual. Yeah. Classroom. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Oh, great tasting note. Uh, well Shout done. out to him. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. No. Um. Thank you guys again so much for letting us share the message of one love. It's so important that the education gets to literally everyone in the world. So if what I said today resonated with you at all, please check out our website or donate. Um. But cheers to healthy relationships on valentine's day cheers to open communication and examples of healthy love um and bill suggested that i also say alone together so cheers everyone. alone together as always thank you so much for joining us guys cheers all right so all the unfinished unfinished business for the sake of these wines that i should have covered mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to run through them kind of in between questions, but hit us up with some rapid fire me. Let's uh, do lightning round today. Absolutely, we'll do, but I'm going to put Cole on the spot one more time. This is my favorite question to ask about drinking wine, and it's the most important. Oh, God. Do you like it? Do I like drinking wine? Yeah. Yeah. If you like the, if you like the juice that's in your glass, it's the only thing that matters. Exactly. Yeah, I like it. How you talk about it if you like it, number one. <laughs> only question that's needed okay. okay thank you no i love it it's very good Loves it. <laughs> <laughs> we have a greek we have a greek chorus in cold background it's amazing um uh what do you have uh for me Zach? uh could you talk a little bit about the insane um sparkling wine market when it goes around days like february 14th or around uh, new year's and christmas and how that fluctuates 
So last and then you know yeah, this is a fascinating realization for me uh, in the midst of pandemic. So you know we went from running a uh, restaurant to restaurants to essentially running a website um, and running uh, like a you know a wine store at Revelers Hour. Um, and I didn't realize how seasonal the wine market is. Um, you know, not, you know, just in terms of what people will drink. I knew that already, you know, like there's this, you know, point in time around the, you know, vernal equinox when people just spontaneously decide to drink white wine and rosé. And if you don't catch it right, your ordering is just off. Um, but, you know, additionally, there are these other cycles and there's like boom, like feast or famine, you know, people just like get their drink on around the holidays, uh, which makes sense, you know, pressure, family, all those things lead one to the bottle. But you know, and then people, you know, go, you know, January is a terrible month because, you know, people are drying out and, uh, you know, they, they get back on it uh, come Valentine's Day. But, um, you know, yeah, we sell more sparkling wine um, uh, around Valentine's Day, around New Year's. Um, I just want to encourage people not to treat sparkling wine as a niche product. Um, it shouldn't be a niche thing. It is a wine for and end of all seasons. Cole talked about a, a full body sparkling red wine. You know, they're, they're not all coquettish ingenues. You know, there are, you know, some substantive, meaty, brawny, sparkling wines out there. And, you know, the brawn of it all, you know, lends, um, you know, it lends itself to, you know, a, a variety of different applications. So, you know, uh, fizz in wine is just a fun thing to appreciate um, in all seasons. So don't, don't you know, kind of uh, just relegate it to, um, you know, Valentine's Day and or um, uh, New Year's, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, stature, um, you know, uh, for the sake of, uh, you know, your, your drinking at home. I encourage you, you know, to, to try all, any and all things out of season. Um, you know, I love uh, rosé in all seasons. I love Riesling in all seasons. Um, and, and I certainly love uh, um, Pet Nat in all seasons. Um, so this is uh, a, I promise to kind of intersperse questions with, with uh, you know, a bit of uh, uh, wisdom about these individual wines. This is uh, Gruner Veltlino Blend. Um, from this beautiful gentleman, Chris Hawk, who uh, has actually uh, been to the restaurant. We did a, sh a schnitzel and pet nat uh, event once upon a time. Um, you know, that's an amazing combination. I was actually, I was somewhat uh, upset that it wasn't more widely attended than it was. But uh, it should be said that Austrian and German winemakers aren't the most dynamic personalities in the world. So, uh, but the wines are awesome. So, uh, Scrooter Bellinger Blend is from... Um, uh, uh, this corner of uh, the winemaking universe, um, and I'm actually and having to help myself for the sake of the varietals because uh, it's predominantly Gruner Veltliner, uh, but it's a it's a bit of a kitchen sink and, and it's multi uh, vintage. Christoph Hawk is very much working in kind of like a a pre industrial um, uh, modality. He's along the Danube, but he's on the south side of the Danube, um, uh, just east of the Wachau, and he is um, you know working on these limestone soils that make acid-driven wines that lend themselves really beautifully to sparkling wine. Um, Kalkspitz means uh, uh, chalk and, and, and bubbles uh, because he's on chalk soils that are more characteristic of champagne than they are of Austria. This is a blend of Grüner Veltliner, Zweigelt, uh, Sabi B, Portu Blau Portugieser, um, and uh, Muscat Altonal. I had to read that from the back of the label. I didn't remember those. Uh, I, I, I am deeply sorry. Uh, I love that this wine tastes like licking a salty rock. Um, uh, Christoph is, is a bit of an iconoclast. He took um, over his family's winery and wasn't happy with, you know, the, you know, kind of safe wines that they were uh, making. And he, uh, you know, made a full, um, you know, kind of uh, maverick top gun, you know, uh, your unsafe turn um, and started making, uh, you know, pet nat. So good on you, Christoph. Uh, more questions, Zoe, what do you got? Um, how does champagne age over time? Uh, how does pet nat age over time? Um, Beautifully, and I'm curious, uh, Zoe. Uh, uh, so um, what's fascinating is these undiscouraged styles. You know, again, uh, uh, Maria Pato, you know, look, look at that slurry. So the fact that that's left in the bottle is um, a, a biological safeguard, um, you know, as pure and more effective, arguably, than any uh, sulfur you could add to a wine. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the bottle cap, you know, as long as it's good, uh, will be a great seal, actually be less oxygen transmissive than cork. Um, uh, and, and I think, you know, in 20 years time, I hope that, you know, Chambers Street in New York, you know, just stumbles upon someone's cellar of, you know, 2020, um, you know, um, Petion Original or, um, yeah. So I, I, it's not the kind of thing that people, I think, think about, uh, laying down, but it has this really compelling biological safeguard um, for the sake of, 
you know, um, the leaves left in the bottle. Um, and, and so I would like to think coupled with the acidity that um, it would age much better uh, than, you know, people might, you know, commonly expect of something that's essentially kind of like fun and, and frivolous um, for, the, for the sake of these wines. Um, uh, I've got another one in the mix here. Um, this is a Grillo Gamay blend. Uh, incidentally, this is like just on the face of it, one of my favorite bottles. Um, uh, he just, that guy just looks like a winemaker. Uh, that is Sebastian Brunet. Um, I feel like, you know, I want to say, you know, some, some people, some of my favorite bartenders, they look like bartenders, you know, they just, you know, like Andrew DeWitt, um, uh, who, my former colleague, like great dude, but he just looks like a bartender. He looks like someone, you know, even if you didn't know him, you know, you could walk into a bar, he'd pour you something and you could tell him like your deepest, darkest secrets, you know, just because of who he is and, you know, how, you know, hospitable he is. And he just like makes, this guy just looks like he came out of the womb looking that way with like three days stubble and, you know, pouring wine. Uh, but Sebastian Brunet makes wine in the Loire Valley, which is kind of pet nat, you know, grand zero in the modern era. Um, I love this grape. It's called Grolo. It means a crow. First, the fact it's very like a dark kind of a uh, skinned uh, varietal. Um, and uh, the crow is typically blending agent, um, goes into rosé uh, more often um, than not, uh, honestly. Uh, but uh, in this case, goes into uh, a fabulous fizzy wine, a little gamay in the mix. Um, this one is uh, disgorged. Uh, so again, it's, it's fascinating to me. You know, you see these, you know, people uh, working with um, Pet Nat as this fun one off. And, you know, it's like, why bother to... Um, you know, uh, you know, disgorge, it's pain in the ass, you know, why not just, you know, have fun with this all and, you know, leave the lees in the mix. Uh, but, you know, it should be said that equally, um, you know, you do have people wanting to take the wines more seriously. And, 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 you know, it will be said that like, you know, cleaner wine, purer wine, you know, uh, it, it, it is, you know, more uh, expressive uh, of fruit um, of, you know, vineyard quality wine with that murky sediment in the mix tends to gravitate more toward you know, the cider like sour beer like places it ages. So um, I think the more serious producers are, are disgorging more readily, more frequently um, in, in the Loire Valley and, and he's among them. Um, uh, what else do you guys have? Could you talk a little bit about the use of sulfur in sparkling wines in particular? Yeah, so it's very difficult to um, add sulfur. So you essentially can't really add sulfur um, at disgorgement. So uh, typically you would add sulfur um, earlier in uh, the winemaking process. Um, and, um, you know, almost all pet gnats um, are, you know, unsulfured. Um, you know, it, it's kind of, it's one of those things like, uh, it is a living wine. Um, and, you know, Nancy uh, says that herself. That's what she, you know, really adores about it is that it is, you know, a, a living uh, wine. Um, you know, so typically it's a uh, hands-off, no sulfur situation. Uh, that presents um, uh, issues when it comes to uh, uh, something that we haven't touched on yet, which is the mouse. Uh, the mouse um, is uh, a bit of vermin, um, a rodent uh, that exists in a lot of natural wines. So, um, you know, natural wine uh, is amazing um, as such, but uh, a lot of them are hugely flawed. Um, and a lot of people will, um, you know, kind of adopt the natural wine brand, um, you know, to uh, cover over those flaws. There's this great meme floating around uh, with uh, a, uh, basically a hole um, in a tank and someone slaps a sticker on it. Um, and uh, the idea being that, you know, it's like flawed wine is the hole and a fancy label and creative branding is the, you know, the sticker. Um, and that's, you know, uh, what natural wine, you know, can be about. And there's a lot of truth to that. A lot of pet gnats get mousy as fuck. Um, uh, the mouse is insidious. So it, it is the creature of a variety of different uh, microbiological taints um, that occur in a low sulfur environment. Um, and they create this perception of, um, it reminds me the most of hamster shavings. Um, it is this unforgettable um, and it's like cork taint, but it's more unforgettable, you know, for some other than others, like my colleague, Joel um, Tyler, you know, is very sensitive to it, but it's this like, uh, uh, it's really like I had gerbils as a kid and occasionally, you know, clean their tank. Never, small rodents are terrible pets. It should be said. I just want to, you know, the parents out there never get your children hamsters or gerbils. They're just terrible pets. They offer nothing. 
they're just a pain in the ass to clean out of. Occasionally they breed, but it's just gross. You know, don't, don't go there. But it smells like their cage. It tastes like their cage. No one wants that. Um, uh, and it's insidious because it's a, a like on the olfactory level, it's really fascinating. It only emerges as a wine um, comes up in temp, uh, comes up in pH. Um, so, you know, it's only something that, and you can't smell it. It's not like cork taint. So cork taint, you can smell. He, um, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you can smell cork taint in wine, but you can't smell uh, mouse. You can kind of get a sense of it on the nose um, through VA and some other things, but you, it never really registers until it's on the palate. Um, and so there are a lot of mousy defective pet naps because working without sulfur is like, you know, trapeze artist working without the net. Um, uh, but uh, the people that do it well, um, you know, do it oh so well. Um, but, you know, I think the people that do it well by and large, they add a little bit of sulfur um, prior to, um, you know, maybe initially during fermentation or, you know, prior to, to bottling, um, you know, to knock back, you know, some of the harsher microbial actors that would make something mousy. So. Um, there you go. I went on my diatribe. Um, uh, Slovakian pet nap, uh, Pasekulanik is a, a native Eastern European varietal. Um, I think, you know, you have these corners of the wine world um, that have been making wine in natural style, like these lands that time forgot um, that we addressed uh, last week for the sake of Portugal. Uh, Eastern Europe, so hot right now, um, the Hansel of natural wine. Um, and they're making pet nat. Um, they're making pet nat on the skins in this case. Um, so this is orange wine. Uh, with tiny bubbles, you know, hipster psalms, eat your heart out. It's fucking delicious. It tastes cider-like, but it, this one in particular is like hugely sophisticated too. Uh, I adore it. Um, you know, seek it out. Um, I can't pronounce any of the nomenclature. It's, it's Pidnicia, uh, Shotskov. Um, and I promise at some point we will do a proper um, uh, Eastern European, pan-Eastern European lesson uh, for the sake of Slovakia, uh, uh, you know, the former... Uh, with Czech, the Czech Republic, Romania, God forbid, Moldova, um, et cetera. We're going to get there, I promise, uh, because there's a lot to unpack um, at any rate. Well, what else do you guys say? Yeah, that bottle is one of my absolute favorites. Just be very careful. It, um, it has a higher PSI than you'd expect. It blows up on people sometimes. So, um, Have we spoken about the Czech wine, Maria Pato, the Zhao Pato, the Ferran Perez? Oh, we have not. So this is... Um, uh, uh, Philippa Pato's sister, uh, uh, Luis Pato's daughter, um, who makes wine under a pseudonym, Jao Pato, um, which is kind of fascinating to me because I, I was reading a lot of uh, uh, poetry from uh, Fernando uh, Pessao, um, who we quoted in our previous lesson, uh, who has a million pseudonyms as well. So it's something about the, Port the Portuguese love a pseudonym, um, which I think is kind of cool. Like I, 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 I dig that about the Portuguese. Um, uh, they have a lot of fun, uh, obviously, with the fact that um, uh, pato means duck in Portugal. So they all lean into uh, the duck thing. Um, this is very much in the uh, slapping a uh, hipster label over a flawed wine camp, but it's not flawed, um, well, which, is, which is lovely. Um, this one spends a better part of a week on the skins. It's a grape called um, uh, Bernal Perez uh, Maria Gomes. Um, so even with the great names, uh, the Portuguese are, are embracing these pseudonyms. Um, uh, from region to region. Um, you know, uh, orange wine, the uninitiated, uh, comes from white grapes um, that are made like red wine. So uh, the, the uh, white wine aged on the skins. Um, so uh, skin contact plus white grapes equals uh, orange uh, for the sake of this offering. Um, you know, uh, a lot of these kind of pet nests, they, divert, they kind of like, um, you know, gravitate uh, to this cider-like kind of quality. And I, I think this is uh, definitely one among them. Um, but it still has this like fun, crunchy tropicalia that Marie Gomesh has. Um, I, I, I favor, so for now, Paresh is, is like the masculine side of the equation. Uh, I, I prefer the Marie Gomesh side of, of, the, of the, uh, the grape, but like does feel like a, a superhero alias or, uh, you know, like a drag queen name or something along those lines. Like, you know, by day, a working day lawyer, but by night, you know, Marie Gomesh. Um, you know, working like drag queen brunch, I think is kind of a fun. Yeah, exactly. Um, as men on like three snaps in a Z formation, as men as men on film would say. Um, all right, what else you got, Joe? Um, yeah, so following suit, um, is, is natural wine your answer? And if your character is all wrong, what does this mean? Uh, so what was the, sorry, the, I, I, I missed the, um, the kind of the original uh, context for the, for the questions though. Um, for the Maria Pato wine. 
on the bottle, there is a sticker and it says, if natural wine is your answer, if your character is all wrong. And I wanted your thoughts on this. Oh, I didn't what's, even notice that. That's on a wine? We usually don't have these things on bottles of wine. I just want to know what you thought. Wow. So I have expressive wine from small. That's the, uh, um, what is it? What is the quote? So if natural wine is your answer. Yeah. So mine says, is natural wine your answer if all your character is wrong? Where is now, the, where is the, where is that listed? Uh, like on that side of the bottle. Oh, bottle, that guy. Oh, oh, cool. Um, yeah. I didn't even notice that. It's like a Chinese. It's like a Chinese. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> a fortune cookie. It's a fucking fortune cookie. Mine is massage my ego. Uh, feel the duck man spirit. Hashtag. Um, mm -hmm. All right, so. This could taste like gasoline, and I would order it uh, just for the Chinese. <laughs> How did I not notice that? Uh, so that is, there's like a fortune on every bottle. Um, I will be bringing in a, a pallet of this wine just to discover how many, um, uh, you know, fortunes they, they, you know, came up with. Those are actually good fortunes, too. I feel like more often than not, you know, I get a fortune cookie, and it just feels like, you wonder who writes the fortune cookie. It's like the person at the, who, what's the nail color? I always love the person that comes up with the nail color names, like Kinky. Oh, and OPI, Kinky. OPI. Yeah, I love the OPI names. I feel like the the fortune cookie guy is like somehow related to the OPI guy or, or woman. But, you know, that's that's amazing. And those are not lazy fortunes. Those are those are actually like good fortunes. I think, and I, I want the, I feel like the, the fortune cookie people should embrace like hashtags. Um, for the sake of their their exercise, um, I didn't notice that, but you know, uh, we'll be carrying all of this wine for many reasons. But I feel like that, like just you know, it's hipster som cred just went through the roof. You know, if it was like if there was a hipster som wine, you know, um, you know, stock market, you know, I would I would buy buy buy. Um, you know, it would be the uh, it would be the GameStop of the you know hipster wine world. Um, uh, at any rate, uh, thank you for, for noticing that, Zoe. What is, yours says again, what? What was uh, it? Mine says, is natural wine your answer if your character is all wrong? Is, is, is it, how is that punctuated? There's a, uh, there's a question mark at the end. So it's just one continuous sentence. Is natural wine your answer mm. if I you're- I think the transliteration, right? So, <laughs> you know, like, Something happened, but also that's the most, I mean, that's exactly how I've read fortune cookies. Is natural but, wine your answer if your character is all wrong? That's, mm -hmm. that feels like an indictment. That's like one of those fortunes that, uh, it's like the dark fortune. It's like, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's like, you know, uh, I, I don't know, I can't, but it's like when you get a fortune and it's just like, you know, thanks for piling on fortune cookie. You know, I've had enough, I had a shitty day already. And, you know, already like the, yeah, the fortune cookie people like, you know, somehow knew it. Um, anyway, uh, but yeah, nat natural wine is not a panacea, it should be said. You know, natural wine um, is as varied and problematic as normal wine. Um, at any rate, uh, what else what, so you got to? <laughs> um, sorry, this is just really funny. Uh, please, oh. please if, you're, if you're, if you have purchased the, uh, Jao Pato, and you have fortunes, please let us know what they are. Uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> curious. Do you have any others? I yeah, asked in the chat to see if we could get, uh, if there was a, like a diverse okay. amount of... I, I didn't uh, realize that was a thing. That's amazing. Um, uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, do you have any more questions? Uh, I'll, I'll throw out the last spot I haven't spoken to. This is uh, Matic, uh Slovenian. Um, and again, like, I, I love that, you know, um, the natural wine world, uh, for all its faults, embraces these corners of the world that, you know, made wine for generations upon generations, but, you know, are just now re-emerging onto the global wine scene. Uh, Slovenia, one of our favorites. Uh, we featured Matic wines before. Uh, they're recently on the skins as a cult following uh, for good reason. Um, I like to, to think that we sell more of that wine than any other, um, you know, merchant um, in the, you know, uh, you know, 50 states. But, um, you know, I'll probably be disabused of that notion. Um, this is a grape called Sipon which is the Tokai grape, uh, otherwise known as ferment in Hungary. Um, it's, it's very recent like. Um, uh, Matija has a golden touch. Everything he makes um, tastes clean and sophisticated, 
but you know, also, um, you know, live wire and electric, um, you know, so it's the best kind of natural wine. I, I am often fond of saying that I don't like natural wines that are ostentatiously natural, where it feels like the artifice supersedes the art. Uh, I feel like, um, you know, uh, this particular winemaker, Matich is his nickname, you know, he, um, you know, is all about the end product. Um, and, you know, he uh, works uh, naturally as possible, but it's a means to an end, as opposed to the end in and of itself. And, and you, know, um, you know, art, art should, should work that way. Um, what else you got, Jeff? Uh, uh, any helpful hints for sabering pet now? Uh, yeah, I actually thought about of... that um, coming into this lesson. So a couple of things working against you. Obviously, the crown cap, please don't try it at home. Um, you know, you're savoring a crown, savoring like a bottle cap, not a thing. Uh, have you known of anybody who's tried that though? Have you, have you, have you had success at savoring a bottle cap? Yeah, it's not, it's not cute. It's really, yeah. <laughs> it's the this, pressure like, is so low. So you really have to, um, instead of when savoring, you're just taking like the seam of the glass and going up and down and that's just the pressure is going to magically make it appear. Um, you're kind of like, I flicked it a little bit at the, I don't know, 15th time I tried, but I mean, it will, it will happen. When are you doing all the sabering? I feel like you have more sabering stories. I saber a lot. I just like, it took a really long time from the start sabering. I was like well into already having my certified pin by the time that I actually sabered for the first time. And then it just kind of became a thing. Let's yeah. Great. Great. Good great. on you. Um, I've never tried that. It feels like you know, a lot of work for very little payoff because you just end up with this like little sad nub, you know, it's like Hedwig and the angry inch of a top of a bottle of wine as opposed to, you know, something more satisfying and plump in the way of a cork with, you know, glass around it. But um, I don't know, I wouldn't encourage it. Although, I mean, like, and, and also you have like the thing that makes cork, that thing that makes savoring like work ostensibly is the higher pressure in a, you know, champagne bottle. And you know the pressure's a little lower. I mean, it's like probably like two to three atmospheres instead of like the four to five to six you get in champers. Um, uh, but you know, with a bottle that's properly corked, so like there's no, so like the Mont Louis is actually corked. So there's no reason you can't savor that. Um, yeah. Just get it really cold. Do it outside. Um, and really dry. Sorry. Really dry. Like if you take it out of ice, like it has to be completely dry. That friction is. Oh, the really? Way. The friction is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why you get the French people with their little... <laughs> you don't want to lube up. You want, you want the... You, you heard, heard. Fascinating. Um, it, it should be said, too, that, like, I had never had a sabering false start until New Year's. So I fucking killed it on New Year's uh, Eve at um, Caleb Goat. Because I, I, always, I always give the New Year's toast. But we gave it uh, at Caleb Goat this year at 9 o'clock. Um, instead of uh, midnight, because we're legally obligated to close our doors at 10 uh, under pandemic. Um, and I had to search for a jurisdiction where it was turning midnight at our nine o'clock, which is really hard because it's basically the middle of the Atlantic. And it's not like the Pacific where island nations are a dime a dozen. Uh, the only thing I could come up with was um, uh, South Georgia Island um, uh, in the far South Atlantic. So we were toasting with the dozen plus citizens of South Georgia Island. Um, and it's, it's summer there. So there are more biologists, you know, looking after the birds, but there aren't a lot of them. And I don't know how many of them drink, but at any rate, we were toasting with them. But I, I, I savored a magnum for the first time and I fucking slayed it, like perfect court. Yeah. And then I met my wife um, at, a, at a friend's like backyard for a social distance like fire pitting thing um, and brought some champers with me and, you know, you know, told them that I savored it and they were like, Oh, cool. Why don't you save it for us? And then um, I hadn't gotten the wine cold enough. So I took off the, the enclosure um, and it just like, you know, the, the cork fell off. And then they had a couple other bottles that were lying around. And I don't know if the glass wasn't good or what, but like I had like all these, all these false starts and it was, it was hugely embarrassing. It was, it was like, I swear this never happens to me. Like <laughs> it was, it was really bad, but it was like, I didn't, I lost, I lost my touch for, so maybe I just need to be in a restaurant context. Maybe the pressure of the restaurant moment like makes the makes the saber. Um, well, we're gonna have to revisit uh, sabering um, for wine class. Well, yeah, it should, be, it should be said. So Alton Brown and I'll afford it in the recap, but has like the Alton Brown is the fucking best. You know, I, I aspire to you know uh, 
is only he's this like lovely like scientific nerdy but like irreverent you know kind of charm i aspire to you know adopt myself but he's a, the best video on it but like there you have a wine bottle and then and the way bottles are made um uh, even in an in a industrial context the uh the glass is blown but then the lip is affixed afterwards so that's the weakest point where the lip meets the rest of the bottle the weakest point in the bottle and then the, the bottle itself has a seam in terms of the way glass is made and you can find it. And where that seam meets the lip is the weakest point and that's your target. Um, and, 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 you know, so it's important to, and it's important to get the bottle as cold as hell, um, uh, do it outside in the interest of safety um, and, uh, you know, point it away from, you know, anyone. Um, and, and Zoe claims friction is, is an essential part of the, which I find hugely fascinating. Yeah. Hi, make it dry. Yeah. Uh, what else you got, Zoe? Any, any additional questions about the pet nets? Well, uh, can we just scourge the Republican Party? But you know, let's be uh, all <laughs> uh, I actually, so that that's a. <laughs> um, I, I feel like there needs to be some kind of sommelier lines, like disgorge the Republican Party. That's I, that's great. Um, yeah, you know, I'll settle for. I think there's a place for you know, like old school Berkey and conservatism. You know, like that. There's a place for that as like a a check on you know the irrational exuberance of you know. Um, you know the progressives of the world, but but yes, I think you know, Trumpism needs to be disgorged. Um, I don't know how we're gonna do that though. Um, I had this whole theory politically that Trumpism was like chemotherapy for the state, you know. So it would just, but you know, I don't know if I believe that anymore after um, you know forty three of the fifty you know voted against impeachment. But you know, I know this this was our we took a stark political turn. I don't know how we can bring it back to. To pet nap, that feels irrecoverable. Bring it back. Bring it back. We're going to bring it back with healthy communication. We're going to bring it back yeah. with like joy. Yeah. Joy. 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 We got, we got joy back in our life. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. And if, if ever there was a face of abusive relationships, it is one Donald Trump. Uh, I think we've all, you know, been in the midst of an abusive relationship with this man for, you know, the better part of his life. Um, and certainly the entirety of his presidency, both presidency. So um, if anyone needs to, you know, um, heed Cole's advice about how to love better, it is uh, Donald Trump. And I, I hope that, um, you know, Melania's friends, if you're out there, if you're listening, um, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> use you know, take advantage of the resources, you know, they're, they're available. Um, you know, I, I you know, uh, uh, yeah, we, we wish the best for you. Uh, but he's he's irrecoverable. Um, you know, there there is evil and narcissism in this world. Um, he doesn't even he doesn't even drink, um, which is like the least satisfying part. Of it, but, he has his own vices. You know. I know, I know. Um, all right, so that feels like that feels like an appropriate. Uh, I, I like I like where we've gone with this lesson. Uh, Cole, do you do you want to add anything else? Thank you for for hanging out. <laughs> uh, we saw was that your was that your paramour in the background? Yes, that that's my butler for the evening. <laughs> oh, nice, nice, nice. Um, is he enjoying the lesson from afar? Exactly. Yep, he is actually he's cutting. I said butler. He's actually cutting onions in the kitchen and crying. So. Nice. Stop. Um, uh, do you uh, do you do you have any parting thoughts for us, Cole? No, seriously, thank you so much. I wrote in the chat, obviously you haven't been able to look at it, but I think that you know more about wine than I know about literally anything. So um, this has been so impressive. And um, thank y'all for so much for including me in your community and allowing me to just share something that means so much to me. This has been such a fun treat on Valentine's Day. Uh, delightful. Uh, thank you all uh, for hanging out this long. Um, I, I will say that I love the point uh, of the lesson where things devolve and they cease to be about the topic at hand and just become uh, a hangout. Uh, and I would hang out longer if I didn't have to go home and walk the fucking dog. But uh, I love, love you all. Uh, Salut. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, please give to the One Love Foundation if you haven't already. Cheers. Thank you, Cole. Thank you for your team. You're doing amazing work.